Very proud to propose, this house regrets the classification of electric bicycles as bicycles rather than motor vehicles. Some points on framing to clarify this debate. Firstly, we would tell you that the general understanding of a bicycle is something that has two tandem wheels that can just generally look like what our common conception of a traditional bike is. But what we believe on side government is that a bicycle means a device that is propelled solely by human power. So even on a semantics level, we think this resolution is generally true. But we would also tell you that on a comparative, a motor vehicle is defined as a road vehicle powered by an internal engine or motor. Second mode of framing is of what classification actually looks like, right? What is classifying in an electric a bicycle as a motor vehicle instead of a bicycle actually change in our world. We think that the implications here are twofold. Firstly, is changing the consideration of electric bicycles within our law. We would tell you that motor vehicles are under the jurisdiction of regulatory bodies, such as the DMV in California, for example, so they're going to be registered and only allowed to be on the road and also only allowed to be driven by those who have the license to do so. There's just more regulations in general once you consider uh, electric bicycles as motor vehicles. But the second implication to changing this classification to motor vehicles instead of traditional bicycles is changing the classification and consideration within public perception. We believe that because bikes are generally perceived within a common definition, things that are environmentally friendly and are used for certain purposes, changing this classification does change the way that people use these electric bicycles because they perceive them as motor vehicles instead of bicycles themselves. Third note on framing though, we propose making this debate on a cost benefit analysis as it is like really just about whether or not we should regret this classification or not. On to our contention one, which is safety. Note that there are many alternatives in the status quo for micromobile transportation, such as electric scooters and biking. But the difference here is that electric bikes are uniquely very, very fast. Thus, they are more similar in nature to motor vehicles than bikes themselves because they run on an engine and can therefore go from 20 to 30 miles per hour. So our argument here is very simple. We believe that the state ought to account for this and ensure that there's not going to be any sort of repercussions in terms of dangers to others that result from the speed. Our first link under this argument is that electric bikes are uniquely fast and thus they should not be immediately available to all people to use. So in the status quo, we would say that they're as available to people as bikes are, right? Because they're classified under that definition. Thus, you do not have a license to need to drive this type of vehicle. But it does go from 20 to 30 miles per hour, which is quite literally what you were required to get a license for if you're going to use a car to drive that speed. We would tell you that the reason why we have licenses in the first place is to protect people from high speed collisions. But at the point in which you're allowing these people to access these vehicles without any sort of license or any sort of training or proof that they could actually handle this type of power and handle this type of responsibility, you're ensuring that there's probably going to be a lot more collisions as we already see in the status quo. Because these vehicles that are literally traveling at 30 miles per hour are can be driven by anyone and can really be driven without much regulations at all. The second link here is that there should be legal accountability at the very least through legal framework that is provided by considering this a uh, motor vehicle, not right now. So when we see that we actually classify this as a motor vehicle, we're going to see this legal accountability through liability and insurance because we told you that regulatory bodies such as the DMV do account for things such as that. So we see that right now, these electric bikes pose a safety risk, not to others, but themselves as described in our first link because of the unique speed that these bikes are capable of. But having insurance on bicycles would necessitate registration for those vehicles. Right now, you cannot even hold someone accountable unless the bikes had a license plate and registration. So we need to create accountability for people on e-bikes when they go over 30 miles per hour, if, and that's very necessary. But we would also tell you in the worst case, right, when these collisions actual, actually happen, there needs to be some sort of legal framework to give these people accountability that they need and the retribution for those victims. The third link is changing where electric bicycles can go. This actually has huge impacts for safety because electric bikes should not be allowed to go on sidewalks as they are in the status quo. At 28 miles per hour, there's no telling the untold damage that you can do to like children as they walk down the sidewalk, even adults. But regulating where e-bikes can go is safer for everyone. Know that the impact of this link, and I'll go over impacts like cumulative cumulatively later, is increasingly magnified when you consider the fact that literally anyone can access these electric bikes, right? So if you can drive an electric bike without a license and you can drive it on the sidewalk where a lot of people uh, like see it perceived as a place where they can just walk without being like uh, hit by like a high speed vehicle, that's going to be really conducive to things such as accidents and collisions and the like. 
but the broad impact under the safety argument is protecting lives and protecting our well-being and health. By increasing the safety of both bikers and pedestrians, we reduce injuries and perhaps even prevent death. We think that 30 miles per hour is certainly enough to cause long-lasting repercussions for your entire lifetime. We think that that is always going to be the most important issue in this round. As, as a state and as just a general society, we do have a responsibility to protect the safety of others. We have implemented uh, we have implemented like regulations in the status quo to check back against high speeds with vehicles such as cars. So there's no reason that we shouldn't in uh, like the status quo with similar motor vehicles such as electric bikes. Before I go on to our contention two, I can take your POI. Oh, on your first point about like collisions, what type of collisions are you discussing? Like collisions between an electric bicyclist and whom? Okay, so there's no reason why we think that there's only one type of collision that could happen. It's just like any type of collision, collisions between bicyclists, with cars, and probably most dangerously with pedestrians. Onto our contention too, which is protecting the environment. There are two layers of analysis under this argument. First is on the creation of batteries that is necessary for these e-bikes. We would tell you that the creation of lithium batteries for these bikes has a huge impact on the environment. Electric bikes use one car set one car sized lead acid battery per year and each battery represents 30 to 40 percent of its lead content emitted to the environment in the production process resulting in about 30 kilograms or three kilograms of lead emitted per battery produced the second link here is misconstruing this for an environmentally friendly type of a vehicle people who ride electric bikes often think that they are doing good for the environment but in reality they are not and when we compare this to other forms of micromobility, such as actual bikes, the power consumption of electric bikes results in an average of CO2 emissions value of 3.2 to 8 grams per mile, depending on the power mix. By labeling them as motor vehicles, it becomes more obvious the e-bikes are actually not very environmentally friendly, so we do have that solvency on our side. The solvency here was very simple, again, to reiterate on our first link. We would tell you when you actually make the public aware that, and perceptually that this type of e-bike is not as environmentally friendly as bicycles, or when you even just make it a little bit harder to like ride bicycles without having any sort of license, we think that we're going to be benefiting the environment that was very important for reducing emissions and just improving the quality of life of people overall. On that basis, very proud to propose. Uh, all right, awesome. I'm going to be going framework, op case, gov case. If you have POI to say them verbally, I'll take them at the end of my arguments. All right. Starting on top of case, there wasn't a definition of this house provided, so we would just like to define it as a rational individual. Um, and then on the de definition of classification as a motor vehicle model, we agree with the definitions, but we'd like to add a bit of background, which is basically that the majority of country over 35 states, including California in the U.S., recently classified electric bikes as bikes within this class. So this is, we believe, the classification that it's specifically talking about. Um that has been recently passed. So in within this classification, there are basically three levels of classification based on how fast your bike can go and when it, uh, when it uses electricity. Um, and then these state laws basically say that majority, all of the laws that apply to bikes apply to electric bikes, with the exception that local authority can still fully ban specific, like elect any form of electric vehicle from specific paths. So if there is like a walking pack, they're still allowed to ban like all scooters, all electric bikes from that path. Okay, moving on. So our first contention is that the classification of electric bicycles as bicycles has increased access to electric bicycles. Sub point A, why are electric bicycles useful? So we tell you that electric bicycles are uniquely useful when you are going places that would otherwise require a car. For example, I have friends that live up in the Berkeley Hills and it would be simply impossible them, for them to go home on a bike because it is extremely strenuous, um, strenuous journey up that hill. Second, 
We see it's for people who don't otherwise have the strength to use a bike. Uh, for example, if they're just weak or out of shape, it's really hard for them to use a bike without any assistance or alternative, or like if they're older as well, this is true, or alternatively, literally, like if you're sick and have a really bad cough, it's really hard to use a ton, do a ton of aerobic ability. So having a little bit of assistance is really, really helpful. Yes, I'll take your POI. For those who need to have the accommodations of electric bikes, can they not get the licenses in our world? Uh, they can. I'm moving on to that. So B is that new this new classification specifically removes the barriers for electric bikes. So as government point for getting electric bikes. So as my partner or as the government points out, there are things like operator's license, state and local registration, um, license plate, and all of these other things that you need to be able to use an extra uh, electric bike. And frankly, this means that it is just a lot more work to get an electric bike to the point at which a lot of people simply are just not going to choose to do it. Or another example is, for example, if my dad gets an electric bike, I wouldn't necessarily be able to use it because I hadn't been registered to have an operator's license on it like my dad had would be. Um, so an example here is that like in Hawaii right now, they are one of the few states that haven't adopted these new regulations. And so their e-bikes are defined as mopeds. And so e-bike uh, e riders need like to carry an operator's license specifically for driving mopeds, not for driving cars, but like they need to get a whole other license to drive this moped. And frankly, just a lot of people are going to choose to not get an electric bike if it requires so much extra work, because at that point, it's easier for them to just use their car all of the time for transportation. So the impacts here, one, we tell you is qual higher quality of life for people who are now choosing to get electric bikes at a higher frequency. When they're getting more exercise because they are still using some amount of energy to use that bike instead of using a car. Two, they're getting happiness from riding bikes because it's fun. And three is that of the environment. Because people use electric bikes where they would otherwise be using cars, it's still really beneficial to the environment to be using a much less carbon impacted, uh, impactful thing. My second contention is the safety of e-bike riders. Subpoint A is access to bike lanes. So bicycle classification means that bike riders can use bike lanes versus a motor vehicle classification means that they would only be able to like go in car lanes. Subpoint B is that bike lanes is safest for riders. Even if you're on an electric bike, you're still a squishy human that is not inside a car. It's unsafer for a biker to be in roads, especially because e-bikes only up to 20 or 28 miles per hour, depending on the classification per state, um, which means that if cars are going very fast around you, it's just very likely for accidents to happen. Um, and it's honestly just dangerous to be around lots of multiple ton steel vehicles that are biking, that are going much faster than you if you are just a human on an e-bike. So bike lanes provide a uniquely safe space for bikers to be that is not surrounded by cars. An example here, uh, on the SF Bay Bridge, which goes from Berkeley to San Francisco, there's a bike lane next to the highway, but under me vehicle like classification, e-bikes will be forced to go on the highway where other cars are going upwards of like 30 miles per hour. That would be 60. very, up, I don't know, however fast cars go on highways. I don't drive. Um, but... <laughs> So basically, we say that in the spirit of being making e-bike riding safer uh, for all people, we do not regret this new classification. Moving over to the government's case. Um, okay, their first contention was about safety. A few responses. One, we tell you that regular bikes can also go 20 to 30 miles per hour. I actually regularly reach 20 to 30 miles per hour if I'm going downhill, but that doesn't, and so all of the same risks of if I cross, like run into a human that is crossing the street happen if I'm biking downhill, what? right? So this doesn't necessarily mean that I should be classified. Um, no, thank you. I don't have time. My second response is that e-bike riders don't go over 30 miles per hour for a few reasons. One, they still have to obey the speed limit and stop sign laws. And two, going like 30 per miles per hour all of the time drains the battery and most riders simply don't want to do this. Then moving down the flow, 
um, we tell you that if you get in a crash with a car, you still can't sue as, uh, oh, you can sue as a bicyclist. So if an e-bicyclist gets in a crash with a pedestrian, a pedestrian can still sue them under personal injury law, right? So it's not like the classification of the bicyclist of e-bikes as bicyclists just means that e-bicyclists are able to run over pedestrians willy-nilly, right? It still means that they are still personally liable in the same way as if I was on my non-electric bike and ran into a human, I would still be liable to being sued by that person. So basically, we just don't need these new laws because you're liable either way. And then subpoint C on changing where e-bikes can go. One, we tell you that um, there are already limits, as per I get told you in my observation, that local authority can fully ban all electric-related vehicles on specific paths. Um, and in this three-class system that we tell you about, a a three-class electric bike, which is the fastest form, is not allowed on bike paths. And also bikes like don't go on sidewalks, period. Moving down on the second contention, we tell you lithium does have a bad impact, but it's much better than cars. And we need lithium to switch over to green energy. And two, a comparative using cars is worse than e-bikes. For all of these reasons, I strongly urge an off vote. Thank you. All right. If everybody is ready, then I will begin time now. All right. So first, let's go over what side opposition was saying. In their first contention, they tell you the classification has made it more accessible and that more people have had access to it. Well, first of all, what I'm going to point out is that even when it wasn't classified as a bike, people still had access to these e electric bicycles. It's not necessarily correct to say that people didn't have access when for the majority of the time that we've had electric bicycles, they've been considered uh, motor vehicles. So the fact is, again, people have, have, have had access to this. This isn't necessarily increasing it because if someone was going to get an electric bicycle, they're the type of person that would get an electric bicycle. They'll get it either way. You know what I mean? So if they're going to say that it's going to be like replacing or like they're going to use cars instead, I mean, the big thing here is that people are not using like electric bicycles instead of cars because it's still a form of biker mobility. Like you're not going to go somewhere far on an electric bicycle when you could use a car. Most of these people would instead just use a regular bicycle, which was the point of our second contention. If we are discouraging people again from using it, it's most likely in a beneficial way and to actually encourage them to use regular bicycles, which we're going to argue is better for the environment in general. But beyond that, we'll show that our first contention also outweighs because the safety benefits that we're adding are also going to be net bent good for everyone else. Um, further, they tell you that it's like hard for people who are out of shape and hard for people who have disabilities to ride a regular bicycle. Well, I would argue the biggest problem here is that what if the electric bicycle malfunctions? I mean, it also still does rely on a semblance of having balance in being able to use the bicycle. What I would say is that probably electric bicycles aren't the safest option. Probably buy something like an electric scooter or um, I forget what they're called, but the ones where like you hold on like this and they move forward when you bend forward. At the end of the day, if we're going to be talking about these people getting access to electric bicycles, I mean, you still have to have that balance. You still typically have to be in a good enough shape to be able to actually use it in the first place. There's better options in micromobility to actually solve a lot of these issues. And that's something my partner was going over in her speech too. Almost all of their harms could be mitigated by the fact that other ways to actually get around exist. But when the specific safety measures of electric bicycles need to be ensured and that the safety is posing a risk without having that classification as motor vehicles, that's when we're actually going to be running into issues. Now, on their second contention, they tell you this idea that they're not going to be able to access bike lanes and that safety overall is going to be hurt for the bikers themselves. Well, obviously people are not going to be going on freeways if they're on an electric bicycle, but even as such, again, people will turn to their regular bicycles because if they're on an electric bike, they can't go as fast as cars and they're not going to be allowed on freeways. This is something that they even characterized. Even before we had the classification of them as bikes, they weren't allowed on freeways. The fact of the matter is they'll still use the bike lane, but using regular bikes has a net benefit because we're actually aiding the environment by not having to create those batteries and also not having the net carbon emission from simply actually having to charge your bicycle and use it and use that charge. So what we're trying to prove here is that there's a net benefit to actually having this electric bike, um, a bicycle motor um, classification, even if my opponents say that 
it might pose this risk. They, in their own overview, tell you that they can be banned on certain roads, and they have been in the past. So why would they not be banned on freeways as they were before even the classification as bikes? Now, let's go into their into our first contention and kind of what they try to tell you about our case. They tell you that bikes can go 20 to 30 miles per hour. My opponent gives you this example where she herself rides a bike and she goes downhill and goes like 20 to 30 miles per hour. Well, obviously not everyone is going to be riding down a hill, but the fact of the matter is when we have safety measures, it can actually be a boon to have that safety because when people get licensed, they're more likely to be the people that should be riding it. Remember our first contention, our first link where we tell you that it kind of limits the amount of people that are actually going to be riding it. And so it's not immediately available. So you're able to actually handle it. One prominent example is that in LA itself, a 12 year old girl named Molly actually got access to an electric bike and they didn't know that it was only for people that were over like 18 or 16. And because that was only in fine print, they didn't really need to register it. And she ended up dying because she went down a hill and went too fast and fell off the bike. What we see is that when we have those safety measures in place and people have to register it and they have to get like a license, then that's going to encourage them to be more aware of the information that they need to actually be able to ride the bicycle so that they know about the safety features, so that they know about what age you have to be to actually ride it. When it's a motor vehicle, we actually increase that safety and there's really no negative um, to it as well. I mean, it's still accessible. You can still buy it, but just having that licensing there and making sure it's registered is what's going to encourage people to actually look out more for the information that's necessary as a writer. Beyond that, they talk about legal accountability and they tell you that pedestrians can still sue people because there's personal liability laws. But the fact is, it's harder to sue someone for getting hit by a bike than when you're hit by a car. The reason is because you can exchange insurance. You already have insurance liable there for the specific accident. So if you have, again, that biker insurance, it's going to be better. But beyond that, if it's registered with the Department of Motor Vehicles, the benefit is that it's easier to actually sue the person because you have the exact vehicle that hit you. If it's a personal liability charge, it's harder to prove exactly what hit you, and there's no exact registration for that vehicle, so a person can, like, get rid of it. Well, obviously, that's, like, a far gone scenario but the fact is when it is registered it is much easier to sue someone i mean that's the whole reason that we have personal liability with cars and we make sure they all have license plates and are registered is because their liability is really easy and people can very easily be charged and then they tell you and they're also that like bikes can go 20 30 miles per hour and that people going 30 miles per hour it drains their battery so they're not going to go that fast but then if that's true, then if it goes the same speed as like a regular bike and people are only going to ride it at the same speed as a regular bike, then what is the specific benefit to riding electric vehicles in the first place? Their own response mitigates their own benefits in their case. And therefore, again, we're going to be outweighing their argument because the safety of the rider is going to be more assured in our world because they're not going to be getting on those freeways. But beyond that, we make sure that it's not in the hands of children. We make sure that they're, again, not going to be going on sidewalks because they're going to be taught when they're having these, when they have to like get a, get the bicycle registration and get these licensing that they can't be riding on these um, sidewalks and that they have to be of a certain age. So ensuring that safety information is always there is going to be the most important thing. It's why for any heavy machinery, for anything that we operate that can hurt other people, we typically do have licenses that are required and we typically do make sure that everyone has knowledge of information. If I could just buy an electric bicycle and I get a little pamphlet in it, has does anyone actually ever read those pamphlets? The fact is they're not going to read it, but having that licensing and registration process is actually going to ensure that people get that safety information that's necessary. Now, let's go on to the, our second contention on environment and batteries. They kind of just say that it's like getting better. It's not going to have that big an impact, but we have to look at the adverse side, which is the fact that people are going to use other forms of micromobility that doesn't actually emit any carbon emissions at all. That means we're comparing two worlds. It's either one where we're using micromobility that doesn't emit emissions, and then one where it does. Again, people are most likely going to turn over to regular bicycles, and that emits no CO2 in two distinct ways. First, we already proved to you that batteries themselves, when you mine lithium, it releases carbon emissions. But beyond that, it even releases toxins into the environment. So mining itself is a bad practice. Not only does it release carbon emissions, but it also releases um, typically toxins into the environment that can poison it. But on our second point on that, we show that alone using the electric vehicle or using the electric bicycle is actually going to be emitting more carbon dioxide than a regular bicycle because you're not emitting any carbon dioxide every time you go out. So the fact is, 
we're the only side that can prove that at least in our world, we're going to be emitting more carbon and uh, less carbon dioxide. And that's already a sure probability because they're not going to be emitting any at all. But secondly, we're also going to be ensuring more safety because we can definitely say that in their world, people are not going to be reading those benefits. People are not going to be aware of that safety information. But when you have to get a license, you are going to know. So our links are stronger on that point that we're getting mandatory information to them and that people are definitely going to be emitting less carbon dioxide. For all these reasons, so proud to uh, propose. Again, my name is Violet. My pronouns are she, her. Second speaker from Berkeley High on side opposition. Um, in my eight-minute speech, I'll just start on the opposition case, go down the flow, and then go over to the government case. Okay. Okay. So the first government response to our first contention about how a bicycle classification gives more access. The first thing they say here is that like, if someone wants to get an e-bike, they'll still go through the steps to get an e-bike. But we tell you that a motor vehicle classification makes it much harder to get an e-bike. And so obviously having to go through a very lengthy process just to get an e-bike is gonna de-incentivize a lot of people from getting an e-bike. If you have to go to the DMV, wait in those six hour lines, get that vehicle registration, get those license plates. You're not going to want to do that. And you're going to probably give up on your mission of getting an e-bike because nobody wants to go to the DMV. So, you know, classifying as motor vehicles is just this major disincentive. And so less people will be getting e-bikes. This is the entirety of our sub point B, which goes mainly unresponded. So we see that people aren't just going to keep getting e-bikes if they want an e-bike, because it's going to be really hard to do that in the government world. Second thing they say here is that basically, um, like people aren't using e-bikes instead of cars. So instead they'll just turn to bicycles. But basically we tell you that a lot of people do use e-bikes for short distances because they have clear benefits over something as a bike, right? E-bikes, they are easier to store. Well, they're easier to store than cars, which is why people use them, but they are faster and more easy to use than a bike. This is why people use e-bikes, right? And so we tell you that on their point about, oh, people will just turn to bicycles. No, they won't, because a lot of people use e-bikes because you don't have to pedal, because they can go a couple miles faster, especially if you're going uphill. So we're telling you that people aren't just going to turn to regular bicycles because you lose. You have to pedal harder. Right. A lot of people don't want to pedal. I'm going to be honest. I don't like pedaling. Um, you can't go as fast, especially when you're going up hills. So people aren't just going to turn to bicycles because you lose out on all the features. What are they going to turn to instead? They are going to turn to the thing that gives them ease and makes them not pedal and makes them go fast. And what is that thing? That thing is cars. So we tell you that in the government world, the comparative is that making e-bicycles registered as motor vehicles will have people turn to cars so that they can oh, get the same benefits as ease and and speed. No, thank you. Uh, next. So basically, we just tell you that people aren't going to be getting e-bikes. Instead, they're going to be getting cars. This is a bad thing from the environment because we all know cars release a lot of greenhouse gases. So again, our entire analysis as how classification as a motor vehicle adds barriers goes completely unresponded to. So it is obviously clear that making somebody go to the DMV is going to de-incentivize the getting of electric vehicles. And we're telling you that an electric vehicle, sure, even if it re releases like 3.8 grams of carbon of carbon or whatever, that's a lot better than a car. And if you're at making them classified as motor vehicles, people aren't going to get an e-bikes. They're going to be getting cars. This is a bad thing. Uh, and so also we just tell you that overall, it's better to have them classified as bicycles because more people will use them. We benefit the environment. We help give a biking tool to people with mobility issues. This is a good thing. We love access. On our second contention about safety for bicycle riders. So the, the thing they say here is that, again, people will still be safe because they will get a bike instead of a car. Again, I've already gone over this. People like e-bikes because they go fast and you don't have to pedal. What else goes fast and doesn't have to pedal? A car, not a bike. So, again, people are going to be turning to cars. And so, again, you know, we don't really like cars. We don't want more people using cars uh, in a second. So, basically, we just tell you that people are not going to be switching to bikes. So they're either going to be continuing to use their e-bike and going on a highway and or a road and just being in a very dangerous situation, or they're gonna turn to cars, both things we do not want. Sure, I'll take your POI. Okay, so there are scooters, mopeds, and even buses. Why is this uniquely the only way that people can access transportation, especially since e-bikes does pose like huge threats to those who can be in danger from such speeds? Mopeds have the same um, issue buses don't go everywhere. Basically, our, I don't quite understand the POI, but I'll do my best to answer it. We're just saying we shouldn't create another tool that puts um, squishy humans into a dangerous situation. We should not make another tool unsafe in that way. 
And even if they switch to scooters, it's like still very unsafe, right? We say that we should keep e-bike riders as safe as possible because we don't want people dying while on roads. Um, so basically we tell you that the bicycle classification for e-bikes, again, keeps riders the safest possible because it lets them go into bike lanes. This is a net good thing because we're not having people die by getting hit by cars. So again, this gets taken away if we make them into motor vehicles, because, you know, if you're classified as a car, a car can't go on a bike path. So an e-bike will not be able to go on a bike path. This is unsafe. We do not want this. You know, that's not good. Uh, so we, if we want to keep safety as high as possible for riders, we should keep it up with the bicycle classification. Okay, going over to the government case. So on their first contention about, uh, about safety, so the first thing they say here is that, like, if you require people to learn about e-bikes and like register, then it'll be safer. Again, we're just telling you, not even it'll just be safer if you ride an e-bike, people won't be riding e-bikes. Again, we tell you, they're gonna turn to cars, that is a bad thing. Uh, the second thing they say here is that like, we on our second response here about how e-bikes don't go 30 miles per hour, they say like, then why are you using an e-bike? Our point here was basically like, e-bike riders aren't going 30 miles per hour all the time, which means that they're not unsafe all the time. It is a benefit to be able to go up to 20 miles an hour. That is a clear benefit and a reason why people use e-bikes. Our point with this response is that people aren't going at a dangerous 30 miles per hour all the time. It doesn't make sense to do that to drain your battery. And so you're not going to be getting into these like 20 plus mile, mile per hour crashes at all times. This is just highly unlikely because sure, maybe you gun it now and then if you really have to get somewhere, but you're not going to be doing that all the time. So they're not, there's like not dangerous crashes 24 seven. They're more likely if there is a crash, it's just at a regular speed of a bicycle, which isn't as dangerous as, you know, getting hit by a car or something. Uh, next on their sub point B about liability and insurance. They say that like, it's harder to sue somebody if you get hit by a bike because you can't exchange information. Judge, let's analyze this. A situation where you don't exchange information is going to be a hit and run where one person runs away. So I ask you, is a bicycle on pedestrian accident often a hit and run? I tell you no, because in a bicycle pedestrian accident, the bicyclist often also gets injured or just has to stop in some way. And so they're not just gonna be able to bike away. We tell you that there is going to be information exchanged in a bicycle pedestrian accident You're because both people are probably gonna be like lying on the pavement sprawled out and then you're gonna exchange phone numbers and you can still sue them if you really care that much. We tell you that like you're not going to have a bicycle hit and run where information is not exchanged so you don't need to have a license plate on a bicycle and then also if you did have a bicycle hit and run putting a license plate on a bicycle doesn't make accessing them to sue them any easier because you know you're probably not able to see that license plate if you're lying on the ground you know blacked out from getting hit by a bicycle that's going 30 miles per hour um okay uh and then quickly on their third uh their second contention where am i Okay, and then basically on their subpoint, on their second contention about environment, they're basically saying that like, you know, it's better to use other forms of movement. But again, let's just analyze this comparative once again. I give you all this analysis on that people are going to be using cars. People like e-bikes because they are easy. Sure, maybe a small percentage of people will turn to buying an electric scooter, getting a hoverboard, or other forms of mobility, but they're not, the majority of them are going to turn to using Lyft, Uber, buying a car, using their car, whatever it is, because that's the next easiest option rather than going out and trying to buy a new form of technology. Because the easiest form after an e-bike to go zoom zoom is to get a car, people will use cars. We don't like cars. Both sides agree we want to limit greenhouse emissions from transportation. And so the way to do that is by increasing access to electric bikes, not making it harder to gain them. So if you want to make um, bicycle riders the safest, make e-bikes the most successful, and honestly, keep the environment as greenhouse gas low as possible, we think that we should stick with a classification as a bicycle instead of a motor vehicle. Thank you. All right, cool. I'm gonna be going over points of clash, environment and safety, or two voting issues. Um, cool. All right, so first I wanna talk about the major point of clash in this round, which is basically about what's the comparative of the person isn't using e-bikes, what are they doing otherwise? So to illustrate this, I just want to go into our analysis about like in very specific categories. So if you're going on a long distance trip, 
why uh, if you're using an e-bike it's probably because you want to go fast right if you're going a really long distance you don't want to use a bike because that would take a really really long time so if you're not using an electric bike you're going to be using a car second let's talk about if you're carrying a lot of luggage and stuff it's a lot e more possible to carry like stuff if you're on a bike um where the elect where the motor can help you with the weight again here if you're not using the the motor to help you with the weight you're not going to want to be carrying all of this weight on a bike where you're powering it completely by yourself which means you're going to the car third let's look at hills right so on hills there's often not, not very much accessibility to things like buses um and also people just don't like biking up hills we tell you i tell you that we have a friend who's like in the next room who uses his electric bike every day because he lives up a super duper steep hill and he can't use a bike to get up that hill it's simply ridiculous um because it's so steep and so he uses an electric bike to assist him somewhat so he can not use a car. If he wasn't doing this, he would be forced to use a car. And then last, let's look at flats. If a person is using an electric bike in the in the flats and they actually have the electricity like turned on and the motor turned on instead of off, you can assume that you're using this motor because you want to be going faster because otherwise they would just turn the motor up the electric bike off and use it as a normal bike, right? So this means that if they want to go this fast, that means that if they didn't have this electric bike, they would be using cars. So here, overall, you can see that if a, the, compa the comparative of a person who wasn't using an electric bike and who had decided not to get an electric bike because of all of the barriers and the long waits of the DMV and uh, all of those things, then the person would instead be using a car in all or at least the vast, vast majority of cases. Okay, moving on, our first voting issue is of the environment. Basically, um, here you just want to like cross apply all of the analysis I just gave you about the comparatives. We tell you that if a person is going is not using an electric bike, they're going to be using a car in the vast majority of cases which means that even though there is some impact of lithium, this impact of a lithium battery is much less than either the lithium, the impact of the lithium battery in a car that's much bigger or the impact of a car that's simply burning gas. So here on way on magnitude, you're going to see that the increased access and decreased barriers to electric bikes means that more people are using electric bikes instead of cars, which in turn helps the environment, which just like then decreases the rate of climate change, means there are less natural disasters and improves quality of life for people. And then the second voting issue here is safety. So under this, we basically tell you that people who are using using electric bikes are going to be more safe in a world where they're not forced to go in lanes with cars that are way heavier, way faster than they are. The government argues that it is important to have these forms of registration because it forces you um, to like become a more safe driver and to become uh, and like learn about the safety mechanisms of the electric bike. So why does this outweigh? As my partner points out, people are going to be safe on electric bikes anyways, because you can't do a hit and run on an electric bike. Either way, you can still be personally prosecuted for hurting someone on an electric bike. And beyond that, like people are nice. You don't want to hit people. Um, but so we tell you that the fact of people being like hit by cars on electric bikes is outweighing uh, electric bikes hitting pedestrians on probability. So for so for all these reasons, I strongly urge an off vote. Thank you. Uh, Cami, you're muted. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> no, I didn't want to like, interrupt because I was like, oh, maybe you're talking to someone nearby. Like, I always have to shout, like, shut up. I'm, I'm trying to talk. And so I didn't want to interfere. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay. Sorry. I'm not sure if you heard the robot. Probably not. Um, but I'm going to be going over the government's case and then uh, voters, which is basically, like, why we went. 
So I would love to ride my friend's motorcycle. It would be really convenient for me and it would give me a lot of happiness, but I have not earned the pri privilege of using such a high speed vehicle yet. And at the end of the day, my personal satisfaction was not worth the real risk of the people it might crash into that is posed onto them. To the point here is that these types of dangers that we're actually seeing in this debate completely outweigh all of their convenience metrics. They tell you that it's much easier to carry our suitcases on our e-bikes, but at the point at which we can prove to you that safety is the most important issue in this round, and just letting anyone use these e-bikes is probably going to lead to people driving 30 miles an hour or a child getting onto a bike because there's no actual form of registration and verification of who uses these bikes. The real risks was of safety, not of like dropping your suitcase off of your bike. So on that point, very proud to propose. Why are the impacts just very minimal? They miss a lot of Sebastian's like very important reputations. Firstly, we tell you why people are not going to use a car instead of an e-bike. Why is this true? So there are two forms of transportation, right? There's micro mobility or just short distance transportation versus long distance transportation. At the top, we would tell you, obviously, if you're gonna be traveling a lot of miles, you're probably going to use a car either way. But on short distance transportation, what they try and tell you here is that you're probably going to get into a car instead of using your e-bike because it's just like not very convenient to go through the registration process. But we just give you so many alternatives to go short distances. There's scooters, there's mopeds, there's even buses. So for those who want to travel short distances, there's many ways that they can access that short distance without using a car that's not 30 miles an hour that like they need to get uh, the they don't need to get like registration for, right? We just tell you that we're not limiting access to these like e-bikes. E we're not saying that no one can use these e-bikes. We're just saying that if you're using a vehicle that's literally traveling the same speed that a motorcycle can, you probably need to go through the same responsibility process of registering with the DMV to get that same type of privilege to use such a high speed vehicle. So Sebastian told you the e-bikes are not going to be allowed in freeways. They give you all of this impact about how we're not going to allow squishy humans to be like squished by these cars, but they never respond to his analysis that they're just not going to be even allowed on the freeways in the first place. And we would also tell you that it's probably worse to be on like a traditional bike and just turn around and see an e-bike like barreling 30 miles an hour. So we're seeing that like these e-bikes would probably be like a huge threat to those just riding like traditional bikes. That's a danger as well. For their point on like, those who are out of shape or have disabilities. So we would tell you that those who like traditionally cannot use regular bikes probably also don't want to use an e-bike because it's very similar, right? It requires your balance. It requires pedaling to some extent. So a very like much more convenient alternative would be things such as mopeds, things such as scooters, or things such as buses. So people who have like access issues aren't even going to be looking at e-bikes in the first place. But the final thing they tell you is that the license process is inconvenient. It's just going to discourage people from using these e-bikes. So First, we tell you if someone's going to get an e-bike, they're going to work to get an e-bike either way. They say no, but okay, let's assume that they're correct. And because the process is convenient, less people get e-bikes. But that's literally the point, right? Like why less people pose a risk to those getting, uh, to those they might crash to. It's the fact that you don't get a bike unless you're serious about getting a bike. Even if I really want a car really bad, I shouldn't get a car if I don't have a license because I should have the privilege of driving that car. I should prove that I have like the legal responsibility of doing such. That leads us to our very important voter and the reason why we win this round, which is safety. Note that on their highest ground, even if you agree with like literally everything they told you, because on the environment, we proved to you that people are not going to be riding cars instead. Our most important impact was safety and ensuring that, for example, the third, the young girl named Molly wasn't going to get on an e-bike and just start riding it because there was no one to, to tell her that that wasn't allowed, that she needed a license to do that, and that she died as a result. Because we told you that the reasons why this is so dangerous, electric bikes literally go 20 to 30 miles per hour, no matter how like often they do that, right? We tell you that like most of the times, the reason why people use e-bikes is because they want to go that fast, at least some part of the time, that still poses a huge threat for some part of the time. We tell you that exchanging biker insurance is much better for compensating the victim once they're like experiencing collisions with e-bikes that are literally going 30 miles an hour that was not going to be an impact that should be minimized by the other side that is like a huge detrimental impact it could literally paralyze someone we're telling you that it's absolutely like possible to do a hit and run sebastian has told me that he like had the opportunity to but he did it don't worry um so we're essentially saying uh, that he he like didn't do a hit and run by the way so we're saying that like essentially e-bikes are ensuring that you're not going to like 
have this type of situation where you don't have the way to seek legal recourse. We tell you that a lot of the times people cannot afford the legal fees to just like do a complete investigation and to sue their person and like track down the person and where their bike is. But when you register that vehicle with the DMV, you ensure that there's legal accountability when someone's being crashed into. That was the most important issue in this round because we actually want to ensure that our citizens are safe than like people and like eight year olds riding e-bikes all over the place. Even if there's at least some level of convenience on their side, we think that's completely outweighed by just the fact that we value our safety and value our lives on that basis. Very proud to fix. That was such that a was round. so fun. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was a really good round. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was genuinely a delight to watch. Um, I'm happy to do RFD orally if you all are ready. Um, yeah. Kai, did you end up flowing Sebastian? I have so many questions. I don't know if it's post RFD or pre RFD, but I got Sebastian. You could have done a hit and run. And I don't know. I don't know oh, I I can explain if you want. Yes, please. That would yeah. So when I was little, like I used to ride my bike like everywhere, like at least like on my neighborhood. And so I was like maybe going like I obviously I wasn't going like 30 miles per hour. Like I was like probably eight or nine. <laughs> I could not go that fast. But I was like maybe going like 10 miles per hour. And then like I was turning a corner and I always like to turn the corner like as sharp as I could. And like my mom was like taking out the trash. And like I hit my mom with my bike. Like thankfully she was mostly okay. She still says that like in some way she hasn't recovered. But I think I think she's fine, but yeah. <laughs> Basically, also, there was no charges because it was my mom. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the story. I'm sorry. My curiosity was killing me and Kai as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, you all did an incredible job speaking. And I, I want to highlight the fact that this is like a high speak score round. You all were able to create a really solid solid case narrative and like um, uphold um, your case. Um in particular, I think that the Gov, um, the rebuttal speech, did an incredible job of focusing on safety. That was absolutely the right call to drop the environmental contention because at that point, like, op was outweighing. Um, when you think about the, like, size of, like, car battery, lithium batteries versus, um, as well as, like, the emissions that they output. Um, so it was a brilliant call to focus in on safety as that was the issue that, like, could win the debate. Um, however, I don't believe that the uh, Gov was able to prove that people wouldn't ride or like prove that people would just default back to riding regular bikes. I really bought the analysis that like for convenience um, and for mobility issues, so on and so forth, that people would turn to cars. Um, and because of that, that's what it truly did come down to, um, as well as the environmental issue tipping slightly towards um, op as well. And so I'm gonna go ahead and vote for op. Again, with the understanding that you all scored like wicked high um, and you absolutely made the right moves, Gov. I just think to be honest, like it was a really tough side to defend. Um, I think the point op that really started to solidify your case, because it, it was truly up in the air when like looking at both cases initially on the flow, um, was the point around the like inconvenience. And then again, driving people, if it's so inconvenient to um, register one's bike um, or, and, you know, all, all the, the stuff that goes with that, it's going to drive people away from biking um, as well as like the access point. And, and then, yeah, the environmental impacts, great job on the voter. Um, that was really awesome. Yeah, uh, thank you for a delightful round.